President Reagan, following his election, said to his supporters something to the effect of, if my administration doesn't see the light on an issue, please make sure we feel the heat. How unlike the recently retired, so-called conservative Speaker of the House who said, don't worry about it, trust me, I have it covered, don't rock the boat. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Mr. Richard Vigory, who is responsible for helping hundreds of conservative organizations raise the funds they needed to make sure the Reagan administration and others since felt the heat. Richard created direct mail fundraising, a fundraising that, one, allowed conservative organizations to fund themselves, to keep the heat on, and to move the Reagan revolution and the conservative movement forward, and two, allowed millions of put-upon Americans, members of Nixon's silent majority, to participate in the political process on a national level. If a citizen was upset or disturbed or angry that our government was cozying up to Marxist dictators, or letting countries be taken over by communists, or letting the lights of young communist lawyers like Hillary Clinton run amok on congressional investigative committees, there was very little they could do to express their outrage. Richard gave millions of these Americans, these members of the silent majority, a voice, power, or as the American left loves to say, the people were empowered. When an American received a letter which asked, are you mad that Carter gave away the Panama Canal? Or should we support these individuals in Nicaragua fighting for their freedom? Or, what is going on with prayer being banned in schools? These people can now do something. They can send money to an organization which represented their views, which advocated their views in a way that mattered. Which of all remember, but I learned to write direct mail copy from him and his staff in the early 1980s. At the National Center of Public Policy Research, we worked with the Vigory Company on direct mail fundraising our first prospect piece on foreign policy, which our staffer, Rafael Flores, suggested include an actual Salvadoran banknote in the window, had the highest return rate on a prospect piece ever to that date. I can tell you, as a person responsible for foreign policy at the National Center, the money we raised did change the foreign policy of the U.S. government. Mr. Vickery did give voice, did empower, the American citizen in a way that was not possible before. Mr. Vigory also played a critical role in creating and driving the strategy, strategies which launched the modern conservative movement, a subject I believe he will address in his upcoming talk. He is the author of five books, The New Right, We're Ready to Lead, The Establishment Versus the People is a New Populist Revolt on the Way, America's Right Turn, How Conservatives Used New and Alternative Media to Take Power. Conservatives Betrayed, How George W. Bush and Other Big Government Republicans Hijacked the Conservative Cause. Takeover, The Hundred Year War for the Soul of the GOP and How Conservatives Can Finally Win. Richard has also written hundreds of articles and posts on these subjects. The titles of a couple will give you the flavor of his principles and views. Grassroots, white, white hot over lack of leadership in GOP. Jeb Bush has no claim on Reagan's legacy. It's not about Trump, it's about the failures of the Republican establishment. The Bush massacre of Reaganites. Mr. Vigory has been a lifelong conservative. He has empowered millions of Americans. He has allowed hundreds of organizations to make a difference. His strategies and coalitions have driven the conservative movement forward and have affected the outcome and policies of our country. I give you Mr. Richard Vigory. Thank you, John. Hello. As the saying goes, I'm a Dad would have been very uh, proud of that. Mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, the, um, 
I jokingly uh, refer to myself uh, sometimes as, as 003, uh, which means I've been active at the national level longer than every living conservative except two others, uh, Dr. Lee Edwards at the Heritage Foundation and the First Lady of the Conservative Movement, Phyllis Schlafly. And so I'm 82 years old, just turned 82 last month. I literally go 13 to 14 hours a day and my granddaughter over here can testify to that, right? <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, and, you know, others can do that, but I enjoy every minute of what I do. I've been very blessed uh, with, with good health and energy, and I hate to go to bed at night, can't wait to get up in the morning, charge hell every morning with a bucket of water. And uh, the, I have to update my bio, I see there, John, uh, you talk about five books, I've actually written uh, six now, and the sixth one is called... Uh, how conservatives can outlive liberals. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> my, my wife and I of 53 years have been kind of health nuts all of our life. And uh, so my, uh, my good health is uh, not an accident. I work at it. Uh, you know, up here at the top is a uh, uh, partly uh, filled wi uh, wine bottle, but there's not wine in here. When uh, Linda and Bill Wildren picked me up at the airport, picked Shannon and I up at the airport yesterday. She knew what I liked, which is cod liver oil. So it's cod liver oil. And I have a tablespoon or two of that a day. When we were young, our parents may have given that to us, and we thought they were kind of poisonous. But anyway, uh, I'm 13, 14 years old in Houston. Uh, kids in the neighborhood playing cops and robbers. Uh, I don't tell anybody, but I'm not shooting robbers. I'm shooting communists, commies, because I know them as bad people. And so I've just uh, been a conservative all my life, uh, consumed with politics. Uh, it didn't happen uh, today, but I promise you, tomorrow, John, before the sun sets, I will save Western civilization. That's how I approach every day. And uh, so in 1961, I had the opportunity to go to New York to become executive secretary of a political youth organization. Uh, and there's a member of the board here, uh, Grant is somewhere here. And uh, that's how I got my start with Young Americans for Freedom in 1961. It had been founded uh, 11 months early on Bill Buckley's family estate. And as a uh, person who ran the organization, uh, the, uh, I was in charge of everything. Uh, but it didn't take me long to figure out the thing I enjoyed most was marketing. Uh, uh, raising money, selling subscriptions for the magazines, doing uh, communication with, with the public. And after a year and a half, I asked to be relieved of all duties except direct mail. Uh, and we focus on that. And I did that for a year and a half. By the uh, end of 1964, I felt that I knew everything there was to know about marketing. Of course, I knew nothing, uh, but uh, I thought I did. And by then, I had a wife and two babies. So I started the, the world's first direct marketing uh, uh, company and it just happened to be conservative and I had uh, no competition on the left or the right for basically uh, 15 years and if this were the microphones of the country in those days conservatives message went up against this uh, microphone and we couldn't get through the blockage of NBC, ABC, CBS, New York Times, Time Magazine but starting with direct mail we could go around this blockage of this microphone right into people's homes changed everything for conservatives <clears throat> then after direct mail it came out, uh, uh, talk radio, cable television, the internet, changed everything for conservatives. We're in this room now, and we're active and effective in politics because of the new and alternative media. And if it weren't for the new and alternative media, we, we would not be uh, a factor out there. So it changed everything for conservatives. So anyway, and we're now living in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm running my company, and uh, you know things are not going well. Uh, Lyndon Johnson's president, two-thirds, three-quarters majority in the House and the Senate. Anything, everything they want seems to be uh, going through the Congress, being pat, put in, passed into legislation, uh, signed by the President. Things are really, really dark. Uh, so I want to lead, and I want to, uh, I've got some ideas. I want this one to know about it. I want to talk about this. Nobody invites me to meetings. So after a while of not going to any meetings, I started calling meetings. That seemed to work. Uh, and so I called more meetings, and people showed up. And I figured something out in the 1960s that I read recently that Nancy Pelosi, who, as she was climbing the leadership ladder of the Democrats, the Democratic Party, had also figured out. And what she and I figured out uh, 30 years apart was that 
You'd be surprised how many important people you can get to come to your meetings if you serve good food. <laughs> so we always have good food. So now it's, it's uh, kind of uh, early 1970s, and uh, a bunch of us are like uh, maybe people sitting in the back of a plane. Uh, there's Paul Wyrick, uh, Terry Dolan of Nick Pack that John referenced. Uh, uh, Ed Fulton of the Heritage Foundation, Morton Blackwell, uh, other conservative leaders. And that plane's all over the sky. And we're just word, and we've got some ideas of how we want to uh, fly the plane. So we kind of get together, walk up to the front of the plane, knock on the cockpit door. You could do that in those days. <laughs> and we hope that nobody answers. So we open the door, and lo and behold, nobody flying the plane. So Warwick puts down his uh, legal pad over here. Phillips puts his coffee cup over there. And for about eight or ten years, we begin to try to uh, bring serious opposition to the Democrats. So we begin to meet at, uh, at our home in McLean every Wednesday for ten years, uh, two hours, 7.30 to 9.30. And then for a period of time, we'd reconvene in the evening with the same people for breakfast with the congressional backbenchers, Newt Gingrich, Ben Weber, Bob Walker, and others, and plot and plan and, and strategize. And uh, we begin to think of ourselves as the alternative to the Democrats. Not the uh, head of the Republican National Committee, Bill Brock, or uh, Hugh Scott in the Senate, or uh, Bob Michael in, in the House. Uh, we begin to think of ourselves as the alternative to the Democrats. And we said it long enough and hard enough to others, people begin to buy, uh, buy into that. So, uh, in the late 1970s, the conservatives uh, around that breakfast table, dinner table, were seen as the alternative to the, uh, to the Democrats, uh, and we were, we were the alternative. And the time doesn't allow me to go into all the examples of how we effectively stymied much of what Jimmy Carter wanted to do. But the point is, we put out that energy, we begin to meet, uh, and uh, I encourage you to do the same here. There, uh, you know, there are opportunities to provide leadership. You don't have uh, control of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is not what you want it to be. And so, you know, people in this room here, you can provide the, uh, the leadership uh, to, in opposition to big government uh, politicians. And we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more later. But uh, I wrote this book that John referenced, Takeover, about two years ago. And... Uh, it's the only book that I'm aware of that talks about the most important political battle in America. And the most important political battle in America is not between Republicans and Democrats. It's inside the Republican Party. And it's a 103-year-old uh, war. Been going on since 1912. In 1912, Teddy Roosevelt, former President of the United States, wanted to uh, uh, run for president again, failed to unseat uh, William Howard Taft, the incumbent Republican president, went across the street in essence, started the Bull Moose Party, split the Republican vote that year. So uh, Woodrow Wilson, first really true progressive president, was elected that year with less than 42% of the vote because of the big government Republicans. And we've been fighting that wing of the party ever since. And sometimes it looks like Teddy Roosevelt or Wendell Wilkie or Tom Dewey or Eisenhower, or Nixon, or Ford, or McCain, or Romney, um, Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, but, but it's all the same uh, party, the same ideology. And so what we've uh, been doing as conservatives, this is this mistake we've been making. We've had our political guns pointed at the Democrats. We're always fighting the Nancy Pelosi, the Harry Reid, the Barack Obamas of that time. Wrong. That's not our main target. Our main target is the Republicans, the big government establishment Republicans. And until we recognize that, and by the way, the, uh, you heard from a speaker this morning that I wasn't able to, to hear, but I, I think he's a good person doing good work here, somebody from uh, an organization that nationally is our number one opponent. Uh, and if I can be so bold and say it's our number one enemy. They have us in their crosshairs. It is called the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. And, they, yeah. and they're serious. And they've got resources and assets unavailable to us. Okay, And we need to recognize that the Chamber of Commerce is coming after us because we're an impediment to growing government, which they want. They want bigger, uh, more government, more uh, regulation for big corporations that can handle 
the regulations, small corporation businesses came. So anyway, that's uh, very, very important to recognize who our opponent is. The, the number one uh, problem, I feel, uh, that conservatives have dealt, faced for at least 30 years, and that is too many uh, conservatives became an appendage, became an arm of the Republican Party. Uh, and the number one need that we have going forward is new, mostly younger leadership. You know, I'm not getting tired, but I sure would like to see some reinforcements out there. <laughs> and we really need that. So Grant, uh, study hard. But uh, when I uh, was a young Republican, chairman of Harris County, Houston, young Republicans back in the late 50s, early 1960s, the conservative movement rested on a two-legged stool. And that, those two legs uh, represented economic conservatives, lower taxes, balanced budget, uh, less government. The other leg was national defense, which really meant anti-communism. We were all anti-communists. Uh, all conservatives of my generation, and gen I'm a second generation conservative, first generation conservatives, Russell Kirk, uh, Bill Buckley. I can say Russell Kirk in this room, you know who he is. But if I'm in some other state, they don't know who Russell Kirk is, and that's a problem. <laughs> okay. I was with Annette uh, Kirk, uh, his uh, widow, just a few weeks ago, uh, and people need to know Russell Kirk. But anyway, first generation, second generation, most uh, probably third generation conservatives. We became conservatives. Before we were conservatives, we were anti-communist. Uh, and in those days, the movement, as I said, rested on a two-legged stool. I think everybody can imagine, two-legged stool is not very sturdy. And we'd win 40, 45, sometimes 47% of the vote. Very seldom did we get 51%. But then, under the leadership of Paul Weirich, Howard Phillips, Jerry Falwell, and others, in the second half of the 70s, we added a third leg to that stool, which is the social issues. Uh, changed everything. Now we begin to get 51, 52, 53 percent of the vote. And by the way, I said social because that's the word that we all recognize here. But I hope going forward that we uh, change that. That we, uh, uh, this is the toxic word to a lot of people. A lot of people who would normally vote for us don't, are not comfortable with the social issues. The word I think that we should all adopt is the cultural issues. 80, 90 percent of Americans will believe that culture is a, is a mess. It's a sewer pit out there, okay? And they can understand that. When you say a social issues, they get, uh, you know, they're concerned that the preacher's going to come, you know, uh, into their home, uh, or, we, you know, abortion, whatever it might be. So if we say cultural issues, uh, I think we'll have a better response from people who uh, otherwise uh, would be supportive of us. Uh, the other word that I think that we should focus on, I have a friend of mine who's a very, very high level uh, conservative. Uh, we had breakfast a couple of years ago, and he sat down, and his seat wasn't warm, and he started railing against the term uh, crony capitalism. He says, I hate that phrase, you know, because capitalism is good. Uh, and it's got, got a negative tone when we talk about crony capitalism. So I began to think about that. I had breakfast with him recently again, and I said, I've solved that problem, Kevin. Uh, and we're no longer going to talk. I'm really doing... Uh, best I can to communicate this to all my colleagues at the national level. Uh, no longer talk about crony capitalism, it's crony government, okay? And that is the problem, crony government. And Republicans are guilty of it, and Democrats, okay? And so it's government is the problem. And by the way, uh, ever since I've been in politics, uh, Republicans have been branded by the Democrats as the party of uh, big business, Wall Street, uh, crony capitalism, uh, trickle-down economics, okay? And that's uh, been a difficult uh, baggage to carry into election. And the Democrats have branded themselves as a party of government, okay? And for the 80 uh, years of my life, uh, most people have had a pretty good uh, image of government. You know, government, in their view, got us out of the Depression. Government won World War II. Government educated the GIs when they came back from the war. Government uh, built the super highways that won the Cold War, gave us Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. So people have had a generally a good feeling about the government party uh, there. That has changed now. And I think we have an opportunity as conservatives to rebrand. But we have an opportunity for the first time in my lifetime, a very long time, to rebrand the Democrats as the party of government. Government is not working now. It cannot secure the border. It cannot protect us overseas. 
we heard about the problems in the VA system here. I mean, it's horrendous what's happening there. It just goes on. Now, the IRS, et cetera, et cetera, EPA. People are now beginning to believe, uh, prepared to believe what Reagan told us 35, 40 years ago. What Reagan said 35, 40 years ago, government is not the solution. Government is the problem. Government taxes too much, spends too much, regulates too much, governs too much. Okay, And so now we as conservatives have the opportunity to rebrand the Democrats. And that is critically important if we're going to be successful uh, electorally going forward. Uh, being a marketing person, when I think about the brand, I get so excited when I talk about that. But uh, that uh, got me off track, uh, and I forgot to finish my thought about the two-legged stool, the three-legged stool. Now, in my opinion, we have a fourth leg uh, of that stool. And we're no longer sitting on a stool, by the way. We're at a big table. And the fourth leg now is a lot of you people in this room called the Tea Party, okay? They are different from the other three wings of the party here, or the legs of the stool. Uh, people say, well, Tea Party people believe like economic conservatives, less taxes, less government, balanced budget, etc., less regulation. I said, yes, that's true, okay? But there's something that's unique about the Tea Party, not found in these other three legs, okay? And it is this. When Reagan ran for president in 1976, he ran against the entire Republican establishment, the Nixon wing of the party, the Ford wing of the party, the Rockefeller wing of the party. Nelson Rockefeller was vice president of the United States in 1976. Okay? So he ran against the entire establishment, which was a Herculean task. And he had a wonderful phrase. He said, we need to have new leadership, leadership unfettered by old ties and old relationships. Too many conservatives, quite frankly, my dear friends at the national level, are fettered to the Republican Party. The Tea Party is unfettered to uh, politics. You're not worried. About that. You're uh, you're not uh, focused on making sure that you get invited to the next uh, party that the Republican establishment has, or that they'll return your phone calls, or that they'll keep you on their Christmas card list. Uh, so uh, uh, keep that independence from the Republican Party. It has ruined too many of uh, my conservative friends, quite frankly. One of the, uh, the brands, uh, and John alluded to that, that I, uh, I did hold Reagan's feet to the fire uh, in 1980s when he was president, and the fire that he lit, by the way. Uh, and sometimes people say, gosh, you're tough on this one, Richard. Why don't you think this one's a conservative, or that one's a conservative? Uh, and I said, I've got a foolproof test of whether you're a conservative or not. Foolproof, and I think I heard the conversation earlier about this today about how you can you tell if somebody's a conservative. Here's Vigory's foolproof test. 